Hello, welcome to Dressed Irons. Got a triple articulated fly we're going to tie today. This is a fly called the Morlock Gobi. Kevin Morlock, who's a guide up on Beaver Island up in North Lake, Michigan, tied this a dozen some years ago in search of Great Lakes carp. Since the Gobi explosion in the Great Lakes, they've become a major food source for a lot of different native fish or even some non-native fish like the carp in the Great Lakes. But this is a tri triple articulated pattern, meaning that the tail section right here is on one hook shank, and then there's a middle section right here, and then we have the head of the fly. The only hook in this is actually on the head right here. These, the hooks are actually clipped out. It's an interesting tie. It uses primarily feathers from a ring-necked pheasant, um, as all of the tail, midsections, and the collar up here, other than some marabou and deer hair for the head and collar. It can be a tedious fly to tie. This will be a longer video because of the fact that we've got three different sections to do. And there's some details in terms of tying each one of those and putting them all together, as well as creating the head of the fly that are going to uh, make this a little bit longer. But it is an excellent fly. It's a great trout fly. I had a customer recently who is going to Lake Superior after some coasters up on the North Shore, and apparently they like goby flies. And he asked for me to tie up a dozen of these, and hopefully I'll find out that it works well on the Lake Superior coasters as well. So the Morlock Gobi will go ahead and get started tying. We're going to start off tying the Morlock Gobi by getting our dumbbell eyes in on the head section of the fly. This is a Tiemco 105. This is a number number four hook, and I'm going to attach my thread about an eye length behind the eye of the hook, and then we're going to tie in our yellow dumbbell eyes, or a medium dumbbell eye. The reason we're doing this first is that when we tie these in and put a little bit of head cement on them to secure them, that can be setting up while we are doing the tail in the middle section of this fly. You tie this in, you want to make certain you have a good eye length behind the eye of the hook and the stem of the dumbbell eyes. That's going to give you enough room for some deer hair right in front there just to bring the head down to a nice taper to the eye of the hook. I'll secure this with a three or four turn whip finish. Cut my thread. And then I'll put some head cement all on the thread wraps here and on the underside so that will all soak in and be nice and secure when it comes time to actually do the head section of this fly. Now we'll move on to doing the tail section. The Morlock Gobi is a triple articulated fly and we're going to start tying the fly with the tail section. Right here I have a Mustad 3366. This is a number six hook. The only reason I'm using this particular hook is because it has a straight eye. So I want a nice straight eye hook. The shank right here is really going to be determined by how long you want each section of the fly to be. I'm going to be tying on pretty much the entire shank right here, maybe just a little bit forward um, of the barb simply because I don't need that much in the tail section or even the midsection. So you could use another hook, say a, a Mustad uh, 3011, something like that. Um, you know, as long as it's a straight eye hook, uh, even the wire, the hook really doesn't matter because this is going to get cut off. So I'm going to take my thread and I'm just using a, a Wapsi a UTC Ultra Thread. This is a 70 denier. That's what I used on the first section to tie in the dumbbell eyes as well. We will be changing that later when we do the deer hair to a gel spun. I'm going to attach my thread and I'm going to run it down to just about the point of the hook right here. 
This is where I'm going to tie the tail section, or I should say the actual tail fin of this fly. Now, as I mentioned, I've got a step-by-step -step, uh, article written on tying this fly, and I go into greater detail concerning the actual feathers that are used off of the ring-necked feather skin. There's a number of different feathers between neck feathers, the uh, back or rump feathers, and the shoulder feathers that are used in tying this fly. So I'm not going to go into the details in terms of the feathers that are used for each one other than this is a back feather. It has the blue and, and green, almost iridescent kinds of colors in it that are going to be used for just the actual tail. We're going to tie that in just on the side of the hook, remembering that this hook actually gets cut off. So I just need to secure this in here on the side so that when this is attached to the midsection up here with some uh, braid, this will basically be vertical, almost like the tail fin of a small goby. Remembering that our goby looks somewhat like a sculpt, and that's kind of the shape that we're going for. So now I'm going to take four small feathers, and again, I referenced the article. There will be a link in the description down below, um, but it talks about each section, the types of feathers that you're wanting to use, why we're going to use those, as well as their size. Put simply, when I tie this fly, the tail section, I use four small feathers, maybe five if I, if I have the extra room. The midsection, I'm going to use a medium uh, size feather, and then up at the head, I'm going to use a medium to large or possibly a large. So I've already prepped these feathers. And I'm going to tie these in. And all we do here is each one of these gets tied in and then palmered forward until we fill up the hook shank all the way up to the eye of the hook. Since I have five, four to five feathers here to do, this can get a little bit monotonous for you to sit and watch. I will go ahead and make a little bit of a montage here so that this goes by a little bit quicker for you because as you can see it's pretty straightforward just wrapping those feathers in palmering them in and then tying them off
You probably noticed that I used a couple of medium, small to medium feathers uh, on the end of this. Sometimes when you're tying the small feathers, they don't cover as much of the hook shank as you think they're going to. So in order to fill everything up, uh, you have to tie in a few more feathers, which is fine. Uh, keep in mind what we're looking for is a taper. We want something small like the back of the tail here and slowly getting bigger as we go up towards the head of our goby. Now at this point, I'm ready to turn to tie in the, or I should say attach the tail section to the middle section, but I don't need this hook. That's the thing about this fly. It's a triple articulated fly, but there's only one hook in it. The middle and rear sections that are articulated basically are just tails that flap. Um, they, they do not actually hook into the fish if the fish bites. So right now I'm going to cut off just behind where I tied, I'm going to cut off the back side of this hook because I don't need it. So without out that hook section on there, all I basically have is just a fluttering tail here onto the shank of a hook. My middle section is going to be another 3366 number six hook. You could use number four if you want, although I am not going to be tying on as much of the shank of this one. I'm only going to go down maybe about two thirds the way right here when I tie this on. First thing I have to do is I'm going to tie on my braid. This is what is going to attach the tail section to the middle section, and this is just like a spider wire, uh, power pro, uh, fishing braid. Uh, anything you can use that even uh, like a Dacron braid uh, uh, that you could use. This is a 20 pound. I'm just going to tie this on so that the first section right here is actually not quite on the bottom side of the hook, but it is just on my side but towards the bottom and there's a reason for that I'll show you in just a second here so when I attach this you'll notice that it is not right on the sides it's just towards the bottom of the side and the reason is that when I attach the tail section I want this to come along the side of the hook here so that it is just on top and that's going to keep my loop basically in a vertical orientation because when I put that through the eye here I want this to stay in more or less a vertical orientation. If I were to attach this to the sides and that loop were in a horizontal orientation it's going to turn my tail like this and therefore the actual tail section here would be going horizontal to the ground as opposed to vertical like I want it like this. Once that is anchored in, I'm going to thread my braid through the eye of the hook and bring this down here. I'm going to leave maybe about a sixteenth of an inch or so loop right off the back end here like that. Remember we will be clipping off this hook right here at the back where that's tied in. So this will hang off the back and flutter as this is fished through the water. Go ahead and anchor the rest of that down. Once I have that tied down towards the eye, I'll cut the rest of that braid off. And now I'm just going to put a layer of thread over all of this just to make certain it is anchored down very well to the shank of the hook. Once we have that in place, it's very similar to the back here. I do not have the very uh, tail to tie in, the tail fin as it were, but I do have all these hackles to palmer forward. So I'm just going to start right here and move on, on up. I'm going to start with a medium to small feather so that it will transition into this section a little bit and then as I get up towards this uh, end I'm going to be into 
just medium feathers. I'm wrapping in this last hackle here on the midsection. I just want to comment there really is no hard and fast rule as to how many hackles you have in each section. The general idea is that you're tapering this. Your third section is a little bit narrower and small and uh, maybe a little shorter but mostly narrower and then the midsection is going to get a little bit longer, a little fuller and then you're going to have the head section or the front section which is going to have even longer hackles on it. The idea is again you're tapering this just like a goby or if you have not seen a goby think of a sculpin. Same thing. So ultimately as this is fishing in the water and these fibers are flowing around you'll notice it's a little bit fatter up in the middle section, a little narrower here to the back. You're also not limited to the ringneck pheasant. The original Morlock goby was tied with ringneck pheasant, but if you have some guinea and some Hungarian partridge or even just some speckled hen or something that you want to use, just keep in mind you want the feathers in the back section here to be shorter and the barbs on them to be shorter so that it is smaller and narrower. In your middle section they're going to get longer and then in the head section they're going to get even longer. So that's the middle section all done. And as you can see, this will flutter really nicely in the water. We are going to start the head section here and we'll have to attach the midsection to it. Like our tail section here, I've gone ahead and clipped off the back of the hook so that all I have here is just the shank that the midsection is tied onto. Now we're going to place what is going to be the head of the fly, front section, into the vise where we've got our eyes all tied on there. I'm going to reattach my thread. I'm going to run my thread down just beyond the bend just a little bit to just behind the barb here. And I'll take my braid that I had before. I'm going to run my thread back up to where it's just onto the straight level section of the hook shank here. And I'm going to tie it in just like I did before. I want to tie this in so that it's just on my side towards the bottom of the hook shank, not on the exact side. 
and wrap that in, but I am going to wrap this all the way down to where I stopped here just down the bend a little bit. What this is going to do is it's going to put that loop, resulting loop a little bit behind the bend of the hook so that it will move a little more freely. Moving my thread back up a few turns, I'll now thread the braid into the eye of the hook. And I'll bring the midsection on down, again leaving myself about a sixteenth of an inch behind so that when I wrap this braid in, all the way down just the bend here, it will have just a little bit of a loop to flutter in the back here. It doesn't get in the way of the bend of the hook. Also is less likely to foul up into the gap of the hook. I'll anchor all of that down and get ready to tie in my material for the head. Again, noticing that the loop is in a vertical orientation so that when it goes through the eye of the, the hook or the shank here, it keeps that tail also in a vertical orientation. So we're going to tie in two, maybe three, but two, um, in this case, just two large pheasant, ring-necked pheasant feathers. This is a rump feather. I like this because it has the blues and the greens in it. It's a little bit on the sparse side, but that's all right. We're going to wrap that in, and then I'm going to take a larger shoulder feather and wrap in front of it. in this larger shoulder feather and you'll notice that there's a lot of fibers there that will reach back across the midsection. It gives me that nice taper like a, a large rear of the head of this goby. But I end up with my feather wrapped in just in front of the barb of the hook. That's about where I want to be. If I'm too far forward, that's fine. I can always wrap down on top of the uh, feather just a little bit, these fibers. But where I want my thread to end up is just about halfway between the point and the barb of the hook. And what that's going to do is give me a nice area for my deer hair head. I'm tidying this up a little bit just to make certain this is smooth and even. It's going to help me when I go to put in the deer hair. So as I mentioned before, you can see, even though these fibers, um, they tend to lay down right here, but in the water, and when they are pulsating and moving around, you'll notice that you have a nice taper from this section coming right down to the tail. The next material we tie in is just some yellow marabou. I'm taking just a regular blood quill plume and I'm going to tie this in on, on the belly. Keep in mind, this is the belly of the fly. When this fly is actually fished, it will invert this way and this is how it will actually ride. So this is going to be the belly of our goby. I tie these in so that 
the tips of the marabou go maybe about halfway down the long feather fibers that I just tied in. So I don't quite, quite want them as long as the midsection, maybe just as in, starting into the midsection right there. I'll cut the excess off and I'll tie these in just right on the bottom. It's just going to give me a little splash of yellow for the belly of the goby. If you've ever seen any gobies similar to sculpins, which have a tend to have a nice white belly, the gulpin, uh, excuse, no, there's a there's something, a new fish, a gulpin. The goby tends to have a yellow belly. Again, smoothing this down so that I have a nice base here for the deer hair. With that secured in, I'm going to put in a three or four turn whip finish to secure my thread. And I will be changing my thread. This 70 denier is just not strong enough for handling the deer hair. I'll put some head cement on there to soak down, just to soak into the material and the threads, just to reinforce that a little bit. And we'll get started with our deer hair. To get started with attaching the deer hair head on this, I'm going to attach this. This is a um, 100 denier Wopsy uh, UTC. It's a GSP thread. I'm going to attach this right behind the eye of the eye of the, or excuse me, the dumbbell eyes, and run it back to the back here. Now I'm ready to tie in my collar. The collar on this, remember, is going to be mostly from on the top side, from side across the top and to the other side. I don't need a whole lot under the belly. The problem that I run into in tying that in is, is that I've got this hook point right in the way here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure it and cut my hair uh, to the length that I need, and I'm going to attach it on here but push it around to the other side. So I've got some natural deer hair here, and I've gone ahead and cut out about a pencil uh, diameter of hair, cleaned it, and stacked it. And when I measure this, I want that collar to go about halfway down the marabou. This is gonna end up being just a little bit past the bend of the hook, so that when that rotates all around and is actually flared out. It's going to stick just past the bend of the hook. I'm going to cut the excess off right here. I'm going to lay this up here so that the butt ends that I just cut are just nested right inside those eyes a little bit. I'm going to put three wraps of thread loose. And notice I'm just collecting and bringing that down to the fly, maybe four wraps around here like this, and that's gonna secure that hair to the fly. Now I'm gonna take the edge of my scissors and I'm going to push, gently push, from the top down that hair to go around both sides of the hook shank. I'm not gonna worry if it isn't exactly um, going around real smooth and, and perfect because this will get flared out. Notice it just pushes around nice and neat to the top side right under those threads and I don't have to worry about the hook point here. Once I get most of that pushed around, you'll notice I don't have that much down on the underside. That mostly is all going to get cut off so it would be wasted anyway. So I want to keep it up here on the top side. I will hold that with my left hand and I will pull the thread in to anchor all of that down. And then I'm going to wrap forward, wrapping into those cut ends. I don't want to wrap them all the way down. They're going to help me in the next step. But now I have a sparse collar on the bottom so I don't lose as much. It doesn't get cut away. And I have a fuller collar up here on top. And as long as when I'm trimming the deer hair, I don't trim all of that out of there, I have a nice collar. So at this stage, I'll be turning the fly over because I need to I'll try and turn this angle a little bit. Hopefully you can see that a little bit better. 
So I adjusted that angle a little bit so that you can see, because see, this is an offset um, hook, this TMCO 105, but you're going to be able to see as I wrap the deer hair around the eyes here. Now a lot of people will try and stack the deer hair or even spin it. Around the hook is easy, but around these dumbbell eyes is very difficult, at least it is for me. What I prefer to do is actually use a dubbing loop technique. Many people do not think about using deer hair in a dubbing loop, but it is actually a very effective technique in this circumstance up around these dumbbell eyes for getting a nice deer hair head. I'm going to go ahead and set up my dubbing loop here. I'm going to cut probably about a pencil and a half to maybe two pencils. If I have a little bit more, that's fine. If I'm short, hopefully I'll be short just in front of the dumbbell eyes to where I can just spin in a small clump of hair. I've cut this off. I'm going to clean it. And I don't need the tips on this, so I'm going to actually cut the upper half of this hair off. After I've got this cleaned, you could stack this if you want, but I'm not that concerned about it um, because a lot of it's going to get trimmed off anyway. But I don't need the tip sections out here, so I'm going to cut those off right about halfway down the hair. The trick to doing a dubbing loop with deer hair in it is you have to keep constant tension on the thread. What I'm going to do is place the deer hair in between the thread, and I'm going to let the thread close down on it. I'm going to keep constant tension with my right hand here. By doing so, you'll notice that even that clump of hair, as thick as it is, it doesn't fall out. I do not want to use wax on the thread to hold this, and the reason is I have to spread all of this hair out. So I'm actually spreading this hair out in that loop. If I had wax on there, it's going to make that very difficult. Again, the real trick here is keeping tension on that dubbing loop the whole time. If I lose tension on that thread at all, see even vertical, it stays right in. But if I lose tension on this thread at all in this process, it will all just fall right out. Because I have to get all of this hair about a single fiber width between the threads in order for it to twist up real nice. If I have too much piled on top of each other in between those thread wraps, it doesn't twist and it doesn't look as nice. It doesn't work as well. Once I have the hair the way I, I need it, I'm going to go ahead and start to twist it. You'll notice right away it starts to twist up into a nice brush. Try and angle this a little bit more so you can see it. The idea is to keep twisting that until you have a nice even uniform brush all the way through and you can see where trimming that hair back a little bit is beneficial because I don't have hair all the way out to like this. Um, I just have a little bit right here to work with. Once I have a nice dubbing brush of deer hair, I want to make certain my bobbin is uh, twisted or turned so it's tight up against the eye, it's out of my way. I'm going to start wrapping this in through right at the back at the base of the collar. Now watch what happens. A lot of times people get concerned they have to stroke all these fibers back and everything but when you actually start coming around and, and getting the deer hair on there, when you pull down into the butt ends of that collar, notice how all the hair, instead of being flat, all just goes vertical. I'm going to get three wraps right in front of the collar up to the dumbbell eyes. Just like that. Now see how I've filled all of that in? 
Keep in mind also, I'm mostly concerned about how the hair is going in on this side of the fly, not the bottom. A lot of that's going to be trimmed away. So this side I want to make certain is nice and full. Once I get those three wraps back there, I'm going to bring my thread around and across the dumbbell eyes up here to the front of the dumbbell eyes. And I'm going to do that three times. Just take your time. Make certain that some of the hair is swept back out of the way. Make certain that you're pulling on that dubbing loop just a little bit so that all of that hair is getting nice and tight along the hook shank. And I should end up with enough of a dubbing loop to get one or two wraps right in front of the dumbbell eyes and right behind the eye of the hook. If I don't, I can pack that back a little bit and then spin just a little bit of hair there, but I think this is going to get it. Once you have the dubbing loop in place, you're going to put in two or three wraps right behind the eye of the hook, anchoring that loop. Then you can cut that thread off. Then you're going to use your high-tech half hitch tool. When I'm working with deer, he deer hair heads, I like to use a half hitch tool because it pushes the hair back out of the way as the knot is being drawn down. And I just want to put in three half hitches right behind the eye of the hook. Once that hair has been wrapped around, I'm going to take my fly tight head cement and I'm going to put a whole bunch right down at the base of the hair so it soaks in at the base of the hair along the hook shank. Before we start to trim, I just want to take my bodkin or the point of my scissors and I just want to brush back because in the process of wrapping that in and pulling hair back so that I'm not squishing it down, some of that gets pushed back and laid down. So I'm just going to kind of fluff this back out and get this ready for trimming. And that also gives that head cement around the eye of the hook a little bit of time to dry. So we're now ready to trim the deer hair head and what I'm looking for is more or less a bullet type shape um, with a nice taper down to the eye of the hook. A lot of people when they're trimming deer hair like this like to use a straight uh, razor, single edge razor like that. And in most cases I do to start off, but in this case I don't because I find that when I do I end up hacking too much of the uh, the belly uh, marabou and or the collar away. So it's a little easier for me to just go ahead and use some scissors. I've got some curved scissors here, but straight scissors will work just as well. I'm going to start at the belly because I know that this is going to be pretty much nice and flat all the way across. When you're doing this, like most other deer hair, you want to cut a little bit off at a time, leave it large, and then slowly work your way down to the final shape. Fortunately for us, the eyes here are going to give us a nice kind of a guide in terms of the overall shape of the head because the shape is going to be about as wide and as round as the length of the dumbbell eyes. Once I have the belly more or less cut here, I'm going to start working my way around the sides. I'm going to cut just enough away to get inside the gap of the hook, like this. So I'm just inside the gap of the hook as I slowly work my way around. And this is just going to be cutting some of this away to give me an idea of my overall shape as I work this. Keep in mind, a lot of this is really easy to figure out, but what can get difficult is dealing with the collar back here. So at this stage, I like to, and mo mostly when I'm doing this, I'm actually holding this in my hand as opposed to in the vise. It's a little easier. But at this stage, I'm going to come in 
and try and pull that collar back while I work some of these longer hairs out of the way. So some of these things like this, I don't want to go hacking in there and, and cut into my collar. So I'm going to try and distinguish that just a little bit. It's going to help me in a little while so that I get the nice shape that I'm looking for, but at the same time, I'm not hacking away at the collar or, and or the belly right in here. I want to keep as much of that in there as I can. Just take your time with it. Don't rush it. That's got most of it. So now I'm going to start focusing on around the eyes. I want to get a nice taper here from the edge of the eyes down to the eye of the hook. Occasionally, I like to take the point of my scissors and run through the hair a little bit like this in case you've got some that has gotten trapped and wrapped down by something. You're going to pull it out and get it out to where it can get trimmed like that guy right there. Once I get the nose more or less done, I'm going to come across the back and just trying to keep that overall bullet shape. And then I'm going to work my way towards the collar. You can keep it going straight back if you want. I generally don't try to flare it out. I either have it going straight back to the collar or even slightly tapering inwards. But that's just me. You may find that you like it a little bit different, different style. Just slowly chip away at it till you get the shape that you're looking for. And keep in mind, like most deer hair, that you're going to trim in a fly. There comes a point of diminishing returns where you're just not going to get it any better. And it may not be perfect, but it's good enough. You notice the head here isn't really, really tight. It's not a like a bass bug where it's really, really compact and really smooth. We don't really want that. Um, this is similar to like a muddler minnow. We're actually wanting a little bit rougher overall texture to it. That's part of the reason the dubbing loop works great because you're not going to get a super tight packed head with a dubbing loop, but at the same time, you still have all these loose hairs that as they are swimming in the water and the water is and the bottom is bouncing around on them, they're going to make more noise. So just keep chipping away at it slowly till you get the head the way you want it. And that is just about right. I got a couple little bit more to trim. If yours doesn't look particularly good or smooth, don't worry about it. Tie up another one and it will. If you're going to tie a bunch of these, I recommend you kind of mass produce them. I had a dozen or so for a client to uh, tie up recently, and so I did 12 tails first, 12 midsections. Uh, then I did 12 of the dumbbell eyes and the rear wing and belly, and then moved on to all 12. I did the deer head, and then all 12 I did the trimming. It goes by a little bit quicker and smoother. But that, for the most part, is the Morlock Gobi. I like to, once I have that done, go ahead and put some more head cement right around behind the eye of the hook. And I'll also even throw some right in the belly right there between those eyes. Just helps that hair stick in there a little bit, get a little bit of reinforcement, because this is going to bounce around on the bottom like this. Okay, so if you got a little bit of something on here to help reinforce it a little bit. But that is the Morlock Gobi. See, there's always another hair you got to get. But that's good enough. 
gives us a nice bullet shape. We've got a yellow belly to it. We've got a nice collar and we've got a, a nice taper all the way back down to the tail fin. So there's the Morlock Gobi. Uh, it's a fun fly to tie. It's pretty simple, basic. If you like working with deer hair, uh, the deer hair heads on these are, are kind of fun to do, especially in a dubbing loop if you haven't done that. But um, it's a great carp fly. As I mentioned previously, this was originally tied for Great Lakes carp. Uh, it has also worked really, really well for trout. And uh, hopefully I'll find out that um, it's actually working well for Lake Superior coasters as well. So I want to thank you for joining me today. If you like what this video, uh, please hit the like button down below. And if you like what Dressed Irons, the flies that I do, um, please consider subscribing. Also share the video with anyone you think might be interested in this fly or any of the other flies that I tied and uh, hit the notification icon. That way you'll get an email or a notification every week when I put out a new fly. So remember, it's fly time. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong.